Last year, I made this the apologetic sound clip heard around the internet. If there is just one chance in a million that this is true, it's worth believing. We're still early in 2023, but I've now got this one for your consideration. It doesn't matter to me what historians in fact do. What matters to me is what they ought to do. That's right. Historians are fundamentally wrong about how to do history. Let's let the biologist show us the way. way. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. Prompted in part by some goading from apologist Dr. Michael Brown. Paul, why not why not have a debate with, with Jonathan? I recently had a semi-formal conversation about the resurrection with Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, hosted by Capturing Christianity. I'm always interested in presenting to primarily Christian audiences, so I'm glad that happened. Well, yeah, I was also going to comment on the fact that, like, your lights and the way that you uh, design your, like, you clearly have an eye for the aesthetic. Well, I'm just trying to ingratiate <laughs> myself. I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm on enemy territory here, so, you know, had to do what I could. <laughs> I'm still finding my way when it comes to live content, but I trust that I was effective enough at perhaps giving some Christians reasons why they should, perhaps, reduce their confidence in a resurrection. I leave it as an exercise for the viewer to evaluate my overall argument and performance, and debates do tend to be more about performance than argument, but there were a few observations and clarifications that I wanted to make, starting with some frustration around the debate topic. Today what we're doing is a debate on the resurrection of Jesus. What was required for Christianity what, to begin was a physical uh, resurrection required. We've got some feedback actually. Is uh... Unfortunately, some early technical problems ended up derailing the topic introduction. I noticed after the fact that on screen was what was required for Christianity to begin. But that's not what was agreed. What was agreed was the title of the video. Was a physical resurrection required for the development of modern Christianity? In our email exchange setting up the conversation, Jonathan asked, Paul, what topics are you interested in discussing? I proposed, was a literal, physical resurrection required for the development of modern Christianity? Jonathan replied, sure, happy to discuss that topic. And so that's what I came in to discuss. Does the existence of Christianity require an actual, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus? Is it an absolute, unwavering, unquestionable prerequisite in the same way that a fire requires oxygen to burn or that an animal requires the same to live? This is the central tenet of Christianity, but does Christianity need it to be explained? As far as my evidential journey has taken me, I've found no aspect of church existence, no aspect of church history that requires a resurrection. If you find a resurrection to be plausible or even pl probable or preferred for whatever reason, that's all well and good. But I trust that the intellectually honest among those listening today will come to realize that Jesus rising is not the only narrative that fits all the facts. But this wasn't what Jonathan came to discuss. I'm just going right, to um, get right in. Uh, we're talking about the case for the resurrection. Now, I asked for this specific wording for a specific reason. I'm growing weary of apologists who braggadociously declare that naturalistic explanations in some way fail to explain historical data. I'm not going to put forward one of the naturalistic theories. They've been shot full of holes. They'll say, there's like, here's like eight other ways you could explain this. Well, guess what? It's, why do you have eight? Why not just one? Because those don't work and you know they don't work. These naturalistic explanations all turn out to be pretty hopeless. They, they really, really are implausible and don't do the trick. But as soon as opening statements were done and the conversation began, Jonathan just tossed the mutually agreed debate topic aside to a less rigorous one he was willing to defend. So, um, Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and start, share your thoughts, and then we'll let the conversation happen organically. I, I'm, I'm wondering about your use of the word uh, required uh, and what you mean by uh, required. I mean, when I put forward my case for the resurrection, I'm arguing that the resurrection is the best explanation of the, of the dead. I'm not arguing that it's logically necessitated by the evidence. Uh, so what, what do you mean when you say required? What I wanted to hopefully get to today was either to some kind of agreement that there are naturalistic explanations that fit all the evidence. So uh, obviously 
I'm going to agree that there are naturalistic explanations that quote unquote fit all the evidence in the same way that I would agree that there are naturalist that there, there are uh, explanations that are consistent with the young earth that fit all the evidence, even though you and I would both agree that young earth creationism is not a plausible um, perspective um, on the natural sciences. So you're, you're going to go with me that there are naturalistic explanations that are possible and yet still fit you even if you, you no matter how unlikely they still fit all the data you're, you're, you're with me that far uh to the extent that you would also agree with me i'm sure that uh, there are explanation there, there are young earth scenarios that are that can be made to be consistent with all the evidence it's just um, that doesn't mean that they're possible you guys did your opening statements on whether or not yep. a physical resurrection is required for christianity and after the opening statements yep. he basically said yeah, well, it's not actually a physical resurrection that would be required for Christianity. And let me talk about other things. Yes, that's how. And then, and then I was just, well, do I want to keep talking for the rest of the time? Like, am I willing to just shift topics or do we just shut it down? So, I mean, I think the debate was technically over at that point. Correct me if I'm wrong. What came out of this is that you didn't deny that my hypothesis had explanatory power for the data you feel like your hypothesis is the superior one, not that mine is irrational or implausible. Is that accurate? Well, I would say that it is irrational given the uh, given a, an, a, um, being fully informed and full awareness of the data. I'm, I'm taking that as it's not required. But since Jonathan knew which buttons of mine to press, in comparing my current position on resurrection to my formerly but no longer held view on the age of the earth, I set forth on this secondary challenge. I've yet to come across a young earth scenario that there isn't some scientific piece of data that they're leaving out. And I guess that's, you know, kind of where I'm hoping for today is for you, you'll, you'll point out to me, oh, well, if you, if you really took this into consideration or, or if you looked at that, naturalistic explanations of the resurrection can't work. In other words, show me what data I'm ignoring, deliberately mischaracterizing, or somehow not fully aware of, in the same way that young earth creationists are ignorant of ignore or mischaracterize scientific data. If Jonathan could identify this, it would be tantamount to answering the original debate topic. So I thought this was a reasonable reframing to salvage a meaningful conversation. Now, one of the reasons I was interested in challenging myself with this discussion is not only because Jonathan is very smart and very well-spoken. I don't have a problem with Jonathan. I think he's probably one of the better thinkers in there. But it's also refreshing that Jonathan is one of the few apologists out there who doesn't go for the low-hanging fruit of the standard minimal facts approach to resurrection claims. You know that we are aligned in our criticisms of the minimal facts uh, approach. And the criticism that I have, and I think you also have, is that if we can't say with confidence what the resurrection experiences are supposed to have been like, it's very difficult to say much with confidence about the, the rationality of the apostles' belief and coming to believe that the resurrection is the best interpretation of what they saw, right? Because if you just go with 1 Corinthians 15, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different types of experiences that are compatible with what's described in 1 Corinthians 15. It could even be taken as disconfirmation of the bodily resurrection. If you have like a hovering Jesus that you move your hand towards him, your hand goes right through him and so forth, that would be disconfirmatory evidence of a bodily resurrection. So um, I, I don't think the minimal facts approach is going to cut it when it comes to making a robust argument for the resurrection. But I think that the approach that I take, which is the maximal data approach, uh, is far stronger and far more robust in ruling out and excluding the hypothesis that the apostles were honestly mistaken. Well said. So what is Jonathan's argument? So basically, this is the argument in a nutshell. We possess a testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. We'll talk about some of the evidence for that. Let's just clarify for a second that only two of the gospel writers are allegedly eyewitnesses, not all four. You know, even you wouldn't say that Mark or Luke, for example, were eyewitnesses. They were reporting what was told to them, right? They're at least secondhand. Um, uh, they are secondhand, but I would argue that they're very, they're very close up to people who were firsthand. Where secondhand is indistinguishable from thirdhand, fourthhand, tenthhand, but that's another topic for another video. Um, that being the case, then we are faced with a trilemma. Basically, what explains or gives an adequate account of the apostolic testimony that Jesus was raised from the dead? Is it that they're honestly mistaken? that they lied about it, or is it Jesus or Russian dead, or indeed perhaps a combination thereof. So if, and that's a huge if, and the chasm between us, 
the Gospels represent uncorrupted testimony from witnesses, then one needs to weigh if this testimony represents dishonesty, honest mistakes, or actual truth. If the premise is true, we have a classic trilemma, right? We've got this, we're presented with this trilemma argument um, that either they're, that Jesus rose from the dead or they're honestly mistaken or the disciples lied about it. it. It gets us to a place where we can run the trilemma to see which best explains the nature and variety of the claims concerning the resurrection that we find in the Gospels and Acts. But wait, let's go back to that opening statement. Is it that they're honestly mistaken, that they lied about it, is that Jesus rose from the dead, or indeed perhaps a combination thereof? That's not three options. That's four options: lying, mistaken, accurate, or option D, a combination of A, B, and C. Did I get that right, or was that an understandable heat of the moment slip of the tongue by Jonathan? There are basically three broad explanatory categories that could give an account of why the person made the claim that they did. One is that they're honestly mistaken. One is that they lied, and one is that they're telling the truth. And in some circumstances, you could have a combination thereof. Ah, so this trilemma is a false trichotomy. There are at least four options from which we can choose. Yeah. Oh. Four lights. So I pressed Jonathan on how he can so confidently eliminate this fourth option. That some portions of the Gospels could reflect reality, and other portions be sincere mistakes. In defending them... This biologist shockingly dismissed the entire enterprise of historical inquiry in the name of his ideology. It seems like you would like me to paint a broad brush of saying that if it's accurate here, that it's accurate across the board. And I don't want to treat that document, any of the documents, in, in that monolithic fashion, right? That, that one pericope can be true and one pericope can be false. So I, I agree with that in principle, but I disagree with the pericope by pericope approach to historiography because I think that you can make an inductive argument where you treat these documents as, as whole sources, as whole documents, and uh, that you can make an inductive case for treating a document as being substantially trustworthy. If, if, that's, the, if that's where you want to put the Gospels, for me, that's, that's, a, that's the first case in history where someone's saying, well, this document is just reliable across the board. Like that doesn't seem like a thing that a historian would say. It doesn't matter to me what historians, in fact, do. What matters to me is what they ought to do. It doesn't matter to me what historians do. It matters what they ought to do. And so I, I completely, uh, it doesn't impress me to say scholars do this or don't do that. What impresses me is what, an argument for what they ought to be doing. And I think that treating them in this manner is good historical practice. Okay, so you... You disagree with how historians treat history on this point. I, I disagree in particular with how gospel scholars treat the gospels in this pericope by pericope approach. I mean, you do see um, sources that are often said to be uh, generally trustworthy or generally untrustworthy. For example, uh, Josephus tends to be trustworthy on things that were within his own lifetime, uh, but le far less trustworthy when he's, talk when he's reaching back into the past uh, before his time um, and so forth. But I think that the gospels and acts are incredibly trustworthy, as documented by the numerous uh, points of historical confirmation that, that I've alluded to many times. Uh, you're, you're saying that the Gospels and Acts are a special case in history that no... That, how is this not special pleading? Because uh, I'm appealing to evidence to show that the Gospels and Acts are incredibly historical, historically reliable. And I would say um, of a very, very... Um, they're, they're at a very, very high tier in terms of their historical reliability. Are there no other documents in history that attempted to be as accurate as they did? I, I would not be surprised if the Gospels and Acts are among the most, if not the most, uh, uh, historically trustworthy uh, sources from that time period. Jonathan, do you acknowledge that this is not the way historians treat any other document? And what he said back was, well, I'm not here to talk about what historians do. I'm here to talk about what historians should do. Oh, so then is and, the answer to your so, question... To that historians should treat documents as 100% true or 100% false? Yes, and that's, yeah, he went on to defend the position that all history should be done taking documents completely at face value or throwing them in the garbage with no middle ground because that's how he wanted the Gospels to be treated, right? He wanted to be able to say that because there are some true things in the Gospels that therefore they are 100% true. But what if there were false things in the Bible? Shouldn't we then consider them 100% false? Like, it, it, in my view, well, it, what he's done there is set it up so that if you can disprove anything anywhere in the Bible, you get to chuck the whole thing out. Which is not a problem to him because they are ways to harmonize literally anything that you want to bring up. If there is an escape hatch, then it is not 
something false. A similar um, thing in, in scholarship that I often strongly disagree with is the disdain for harmonization, which I think is a very good historical practice. And so regardless of whether scholars like to harmonize, uh, I think they should like to harmonize. It's very clear that there are statements there where each proposition must be evaluated independently. There's a reason that propositional logic doesn't begin with, here's a book by so-and-so, either the whole book is true or not. And you know, you pointing out that historians don't do it this way, when he talks about, I'm not talking about what historians do, what they should do, they should do it the way they do. Nobody should be looking at something where multiple statements all have to be accepted as a package deal. I mean, this is kissing Hank's ass 101. So in order to make Jonathan's case, and accept his conclusion that the Gospels are immune from being correct in some parts, but incorrect in other parts, he's asking us to put these documents as sole members of a new and unprecedented category, completely unique in all of human history. On what evidentiary basis shall we invent an entirely new historical classification? For such a bold paradigm shift, I'm sure Jonathan has something rock solid. So one category of evidence for the uh, reliability of the Gospels and their grounding in eyewitness testimony is a category of evidence known as undesigned coincidences, where basically you have sometimes two works by different authors intersecting in a way that would be unlikely if one of them were copied from the other or both were copied, copied from a common source. Ah, uh, yes. Undesigned coincidences. Jonathan's signature argument to the extent that I knew in advance to address it in my opening. In the past, and today, Jonathan has leaned into an apologetic called undesigned coincidences, the notion that subtle hints in disparate documents are unintentionally affirming. I confess that I have been dismissive of this particular apologetic in, in the past, if only in part because Christian me, even Christian me, found this to be straining credulity far from needing custom ad hoc rationalizations for each one, each example to me is clearly one or more of literary dependence, harmonizing established tradition, which may well even have historical kernels, pure speculation, or even actual coincidence. And how do we know an undesigned coincidence from an actual coincidence? Sure, good question. So it's it's a mark of casualness, I think, is a hallmark of verisimilitude. Uh, it's it's the casualness and artlessness. Casualness? You you just say casualness. So casualness is the answer of how we know the difference between just people who are telling the same story in different ways versus you know eyewitnesses who 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 were there. I, I guess is is that what it comes down to? So it synchronizes exactly as you would expect, given the chronology of John, and does so in such a casual and undeliberate way that actually supports the historicity of the account in this very specific um, detail. Uh, again, it's, it's the mark of casualness, and uh, it's, it's the mark of casualness where you have this very casual reference that's completely unconnected. So it's very, very casual and very subtle. Ah, uh, yes. That unassailable correlation between casualness and truthfulness and accuracy. Keep your distance though, Chewie, but don't look like you're trying to keep your distance. I don't know, fly casual. Anything else besides casualness? But you do have very specific details that are preserved. So the identity of the, of the disciple Jesus turned to at the feeding of the 5,000, the, the specific uh, number of days before Passover, Jesus entered Bethany and so forth. That's a level of specificity, which I doubt was preserved in these oral traditions that were circulating in the early years of Christianity. I, I don't think well, that the early specificity, we're talking about very minor and very specific detail, that, that level of specificity uh, and, and so many examples of it that we can historically confirm. Specificity and so many? I mean, there's just so many of those and they often involve very particular minor peripheral details that uh, in my judgment, the, the best explanation is that these actually do reflect, reflect historical details, historically true facts. And there's an inductive argument that given that there's so many points of the where you can actually confirm uh, and historically cross check these sources. Okay. So what should convince me that there are undesigned coincidences in the Gospels are quantity, specificity, and casualness, three entirely subjective, qualitative, nebulous, intangible properties that are not clearly differentiated from other explanations. And based on these seemingly arbitrary measures, I should be so convinced that I'm willing to put the Gospels into a category of unassailable 100% reliability? 
that is unique among all documents in all of history? That's Jonathan's case? I should feel a certain way? I was even willing to grant, for the sake of discussion only, that all of Jonathan's proposed undesigned coincidences could be traced back to a historical kernel. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to go all the way that that was eyewitness, but they're all true because the stories that eventually came to the gospel writers were true. Let's assume that like all, all that stuff about Jesus's ministry, that all actually happened exactly as is in the gospel. All that ministry stuff happened. How does that get us to this resurrection question? What, what am I missing? Where, how do I connect the dots? If we add up all the undesigned coincidences and undesigned delusions and all those things, if we add those all together, how does that add up to Christianity requiring a resurrection as opposed to being a best example? So I'm saying that what we have in the Gospels actually reflects eyewitness testimony. If that's the case, that doesn't necessarily entail the resurrection. This is a very common objection, okay. uh, technically correct, that atheists will make against uh, the maximal data approach. Uh, that demonstration of numerous mundane facts in the Gospels doesn't entail the resurrection took place. I completely agree with that. Well, I'm glad we agree. As far as I'm concerned, that's the core of the debate. Jonathan's arguments boil down to the Gospels are in a singular category of infallibility. That is to say, immunity from being partially correct and partially incorrect, and how we can know this is because of coincidences, that may or may not feel casual, fall somewhere on a nebulous scale of specificity, and in a quantity that for some, cumulatively overcomes the individual mundanity. So the history of Christianity does not require a resurrection. There are thousands of natural explanations that seem to fit the data. My personal favorite that I enjoy exploring is a single individual who was sincerely mistaken, started this whole thing off. And there's nothing presented today that eliminates that hypothesis or even under, undermines its explanatory power unless you are want to give the Gospels and Acts a single place in history as the only document that all historians would say is either uniformly true or uniformly false, that you have to take the supernatural parts at the same face value as other parts that may have coincidences that either impress you or don't. They don't impress me. Uh, and I also don't see how being accurate in one portion of what they say it says applies across the board. So I hope that you would agree with me though, that a resurrection is not a requirement and that we can then go about and decide which is the best, uh, best option. And I think a naturalistic explanation is the best option. That's it for the main topic. But there are a few other nuggets from the debate that I think are worth highlighting. For example, Jonathan had one more complaint about how historians do history. I mean, a similar um, thing in, in scholarship that I often strongly disagree with is the disdain for harmonization, which I think is a very good historical practice. And so regardless of whether scholars like to harmonize, uh, I think they should like to harmonize. In apologetics, harmonization is coming up with hypothetical explanations for contradictions, or what they would call apparent contradictions, in the Gospels, or biblical passages in general. In episode BF12, you were battling barbarians while riding a winged Appaloosa. Yet in the very next scene, my dear, you're clearly atop a winged Arabian. Please to explain it. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. Jonathan wants to take both confirming details and disconfirming details as affirmation of authentic historical reportage. And uh, so that... Um also, I think, strengthens the case uh, for undesigned coincidences when you have these minor uh, discrepancies uh, uh, between the accounts. Um, it's kind of a heads you win, tails you lose yeah. thing. Both. All right, Joe, you remember the rules. Heads I win, tails you lose. Just flip. <laughs> that tails! Damn it! Both discrepancies and differences, uh, both discrepancies and collaboration are both evidence, it's, it seems like. And someone picked up on this epistemic asymmetry in the audience Q&A. From Eddie Dean, Jonathan, how can you give little coincidences more weight than major contradictions in the Gospels? So I, I do think that there is um, an epistemic asymmetry here. And what I mean by that is that 
historical points of confirmation of very minor details are significantly more evidence for reliability than the discrepancies are in disconfirming reliability. And the reason for that is because there are far more ways that one can be honestly mistaken about um, a particular fact or that one uh, that, that we might be just simply missing uh, a piece of information that, that harmonizes uh, the, the accounts. There are far more ways in which that could be the case than there are ways in which the historical confirmations uh, could exist on the hypothesis of uh, historical fictionalization. I just want to say that epistemic asymmetry is exactly why I reject miracle claims in general, because there's so many more ways to be wrong about it than to be right about it. Besides the ineffectualness of the minimal facts approach, Jonathan and I also issue some arguments from apostle martyrdom. And so Christians were um, persecuted fiercely under the Emperor Nero uh, from 64 AD onwards. And um, Peter and Paul, as you rightly said, seem to have got caught up in that persecution. And it seems that Nero's motivations for persecuting the Christians was not so much theological precision, uh, but it, rather it was political. He needed a scapegoat. So I, I, I do think that that uh, does reduce the evidential value of their of the specific fact that they're martyred. There's no reason at all, in fact, some reason to think otherwise, that the apostles uh, that were persecuted under Nero, Peter, Paul, etc., were given no opportunity to recant. There's reason to think that they probably weren't right. given um, opportunity to recant, and no reason to think cool. that there is. So, um, so we, we agree there. So on what does he rest his case for eyewitness sincerity? That the early apostles were willing to voluntarily undergo and endure sufferings, hardships, imprisonments, dangers, and so forth on account of their testimony. And that goes a long way towards establishing, it doesn't prove, but it goes a long way towards establishing that they were at least sincere. And um, we, we have good reason to think that the book of Acts is substantially trustworthy, that it was written by a compa traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a general context of danger and persecution and imprisonments and so forth that I would appeal to more so than the specific martyrdom of any one apostle. We can't pinpoint eyewitnesses putting their lives in danger. But Jonathan appeals to a general context of danger. Perhaps this general context is casual, specific, and plentiful. Luke Acts okay. being reliable. So the, the evidence is entirely in Acts. Correct. Entirely in a single document within the New Testament? It's time to break out. I'm, I'm not making a circular argument that the resurrection account is reliable, therefore Jesus rose from the dead. Mm. Of course, if the resurrection account is reliable, Jesus rose from the dead. Um, and Dale Allison, as you know, in, in his book on the resurrection, charges the maximal data theorists like myself with that sort of begging the question fallacy. Jonathan, like all others before him, fails to convince me that there were eyewitnesses out there proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus within the context of persecution. I'm supposed to just assume this was the case. As far as I can tell in the book of Acts, after around chapter 4, the apostles, the, the 12 disciples, the 12 people, and if even if we include Matthias, right, they kind of disappear from Acts, uh, save for Peter and John. Would you agree? Correct. Mm -hmm. So you're not making, uh, I assume you're not in, saying that any of those are ones that you would name by name to say, well, that person was willing to suffer and die, right? Because we don't know what happened to them. So as I said before, the the nuanced argument that I'm going to make from martyrdom is to do with the general context of persecution. We can't give specific examples. I, I mentioned no, I, I, in, but in I just even willing to die. Like, I don't know that Bartholomew did anything after, right. after chapter four. But the but the early apostles who 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 wrote the so the the um, gospel authors uh, who relayed the stories uh, or the the ones from whom the stories came concerning the resurrection they certainly were uh, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus and they were willing to be persecuted on as uh, on account of that ah so we're back to the huge elephant in the room were the gospel authors eyewitnesses to anything. I guess I was just I would wanting to know what this willing to die adds. Like, let's say I'm already on board. If I'm already on board with the that these are reliable documents, do I actually even need the willing to die argument? Doesn't seem like I do. I have a jingle for that, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you guys think about returning to the uh, the Hume question and then doing some sure. Q &A? Quote, yeah, let's talk about there. Hume. Uh, so there's a number of problems I have with Hume. Um, one of the biggest ones is 
that so, so David Hume uh, isn't necessarily saying that miracles don't happen and ruling it out a priori. Rather, he's saying that even if a miracle did occur, you can't justifiably come to the conclusion that a miracle has occurred in history because a miracle by its very nature is the least probable explanation uh, because uh, it, otherwise it wouldn't be a miracle. That's, that's the very nature of the case. Right. That was and my so last slide, everyone... actually. I, don't, you, I didn't read it out loud, but that was actually the, the basis of my last slide mm -hmm. on my presentation. So we can go back. I'll read it now. By the way, historical evidence for resurrection is insufficient to conclude the resurrection is true, even if it is actually true. Jonathan then appealed to theological reasons why miracles would be rare events. But that misses the point of my appeal to Hume. Given that we have independent reason to think Christianity is true, that in turn uh, informs our assessment of the prior probability of God performing a miracle case, a miracle in Jesus' case specifically. Uh, and of course, the, that prior probability, that that assumption hasn't been made on my part. So my prior probability is definitely going to be different than yours. But I, I still don't get how in any miracle claim, be it a miracle claim from yesterday or a miracle claim from thousands of years ago, that I can put that it actually happened ahead of someone is mistaken or someone is lying. Because on every single day, millions of people are mistaken, millions of people lie, but on any given day, there's, there can't be millions of miracles. There's probably only a few miracles. So I cannot see how that can ever become more likely than those two things that are mundane. So your, your frequentist approach is, I think, inappropriate for the reason that I've already given, that uh, you, it's, it's highly predicted on the hypothesis that miracles are not going to be a very common occurrence. They're going to recognizably deviate from the way nature normally behaves. Um, and so the fact that you observe that, given that it's so highly expected on the hypothesis, can be a significant objection to the hypothesis in question. But the evidence given for these miracles is the exact same kind of evidence that would be given for someone sincerely mistaken. The sincerely mistaken person is going to leave the exact same kind of testimony indistinguishable from the, that the miracle I, I actually happened. I'm not advocating that miracle claims are rejected a priori. My concern is the sufficiency of evidence provided to corroborate the proposition. I, sh I should clarify the, the the thing I said before was was only when when testimony is the major source of the witness. I, I would agree that a miracle claim from yesterday, if there was uh, medical documentation, all that kind of thing, that could absolutely raise the significance. So I I, I do want to just lest anyone accuse me of uh, anything weird there. I, I do mean when it's based on testimony alone. In inquiries, Hume says that no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. The, I guess we're just saying even if that miracle happened, it doesn't seem like testimony could ever be relied on. Uh, and you're talking about subtleness of testimony. I just can't come with you, I guess, that, that there's a type of testimony that ever will seem more likely than someone being sincerely mistaken. Well, that, that's just mathematically false, right? Because um, test, if testimony conveys some evidential value in confirming uh, a particular proposition, then uh, there has to be a certain level of, of testimony in terms of quantity and quality that will overcome the initial intrinsically low prior probability of the miracle itself. I don't know. Uh, this is a worldview difference that you and I have that I'm not sure will be overcome here. All right, maybe we could move on to Q&A if, if Cameron's willing to do that. Yeah, that's a that's a good which brings us to one last moment I thought would be worth addressing regarding miracles that came up in the Q&A. So this one's from Testify. Capturing Christianity, does Jonathan have a few good examples of modern miracle reports? But yeah, there, there are plenty of examples. One example that comes to mind, uh, for instance, is Barbara Snyder's case of healing from multiple sclerosis uh, when she was uh, completely paralyzed and, and um, blind and uh, her, her feet had curled up and, uh, and so forth. And she, there was a uh, Requ this, this is discussed in Lee Strobel's book, uh, The Case for Miracles. At the time of the publication of Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Miracles, this uh, had been, uh, she had been persistently healed of, of MS for more than 35 years. And so it doesn't, uh, it, it seems that her multiple sclerosis was too far advanced to be, for it to be plausibly the result of, um, of um, relapsing and remission MS. And uh, given the fact that it's endured for 35 years, that seems to undermine that hypothesis as well. And then also given the fact that it took place in the context of prayer. So somewhere my partner Shannon Q is screaming 
about that example from multiple sclerosis as my partner Shannon Q has multiple sclerosis and has looked into that one quite a lot. Yeah, no, Paul was absolutely right. I was and am currently somewhere kind of freaking out about this a little bit by just sheer coincidence. Moments before I sat down to record this, I lost a portion of my visual field. That's just a thing that happens to you. Sometimes when you have multiple sclerosis, you lose the ability to do things that other people take for granted, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently, and you will just never know until the time comes. That's one of the reasons why this is so exceptionally frustrating to me. Not only because Barbara's story is one that I don't personally buy into, but because it's so frequently weaponized. When I looked into her story initially, I didn't look into it because I was interested. I looked into it because I had been under a barrage of people, some with and some without the best of intentions, who had sent me her story because they thought it would give me hope. I looked into this story and it seemed sort of tenuous at best. Most of the people that are still purporting that this story is true seem to gain some sort of financial benefit from continuing to do so. And a lot of the facts didn't particularly seem to line up for me. Now, that's not to say that maybe it didn't happen. Maybe some sort of miraculous event took place and Barbara was miraculously healed. That's not the point, though. The point is when you use this type of story with somebody like me, functionally what you're saying is if you were more pious, God would make you better. But you're choosing not to be pious, so God won't. Now, just imagine momentarily that you are a Christian who believes this story who believes that of the millions and millions of us who are currently walking the earth with multiple sclerosis, God chose just Barbara, just Barbara, not the rest of us, not the rest of us who are pious even, just Barbara, to demonstrate what? That he will randomly select a person, just one, to rid this disease from? Why not all of us? Why not even just a little bit more of us? When you send something like this to someone like me, you're functionally saying that you could change the state of affairs of your physiology, something that's beyond your control, something that God would have known was in the plan for you by simply acting different or believing different than you currently do. And I know people maybe have the best of intentions and they think to themselves, well, this woman had hope. Maybe I'm giving you hope, but you're not. You're just saying that somebody had something special happen to them that wasn't you. I can't for the life of me determine why it is that people's humanity allows them to do something like that. Even if Barbara's case was true, I of course would think that there's some sort of natural explanation for that. Possibly a misdiagnosis. Maybe she's made the entire thing up. Maybe some sort of physiological thing happened that it's, I don't know. And you know what? It doesn't even matter because it is just her. All a miracle says to the people who haven't had a miracle is that you don't deserve one. And that's just a reprehensible thing to convey to another human being. And it's hard hearing things like Barbara being brought up in a debate. Like, that should be a reason for somebody like me. So how foolish would I be after Barbara clearly was cured? How foolish would I be to not set aside my belief that God doesn't exist and just at least give it a solid try? on the off chance that in my desperation, God will take pity on me. If that's who that God is, I really can't conceive of why it is that apologists would want to be apologizing for him. What a horrible, horrible way to show love towards something that you apparently created. It's an emotional subject matter for me, so it's difficult for me to be articulate in a detached way. I want to convey to people that when somebody espouses the story of a miracle as though I would be foolish not to believe it. When it's a disease that I have, a disease that I'm going to wake up every morning with and go to sleep every night with forever, a disease that's probably going to take aspects of me away without warning, not because of anything I've done. You're throwing it into the realm of there's something I can do about it. You're functionally saying, if you were a more pious or better person, if you were like me, and you believed the things that I believed, there's a significantly better chance that this wouldn't have happened to you or could be gone. And isn't that a hopeful? Shouldn't you, Shannon, be excited about that? There's at least a possibility, right? Right now I have zero possibility that this is going to be taken away from me. 
there's no cure for multiple sclerosis. So I suppose they think to themselves, well, this will at least give you that iota of hope, but it doesn't. <laughs> One, I can't convince myself to believe in God, so even if it were true, I'm not going to be able to avail of it, which puts me in the category of people that God could help and is choosing not to. And it might be even worse if I were a Christian, because if I were a Christian, it would put it in the realm of people who believe have a higher probability than average of having this taken away from them. So that is a possibility for you. And you would always stop and wonder, what am I doing wrong? Why is he not choosing me? Why did he choose Barbara? It's a weird apologetic. You're either communicating that he could help me but is choosing not to because I don't believe the right things, or I do believe the right things and he's choosing not to, and now I have to figure out why. And neither one of those seem like a position worth apologizing for. Anyway, elevate the discourse. Bye. Thank you, Jen. Her incredible brain graces not only call-in shows, but Shannon has her own channel, aptly named Shannon Q, where she elevates the Discord and has complex conversations. If you're not already subscribed, you should remedy that today. Obviously, the two-hour conversation contained many moments we didn't cover today, so I'd encourage you to check out the whole thing to ensure that I haven't unfairly misrepresented anything. I feel like I'm still learning and trying to find my comfort zone when it comes to live interactions. But I keep trying. Let me know any feedback you have here in the comments. Until someone outside the Magrupi Quartet starts banging that maximal case drum, I think I'm done with undesigned coincidences for a while. I do not find them casual, specific, or plentiful. And nor do most Christians. For more counter-apologetics, Tap on the thumbnail on screen now, and I'll see you over there. Until next time. Later.